Philippians 3, 8, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. Heavenly Father, bless, I pray, the reading of Your Word. Lord, let these wonderful words of life get down deep into our heart as we make our way back into the book of John, Lord, and examine what's happening right before you go to Calvary. Help us to understand it, and Lord, to accurately apply it, and Lord, to learn it, love it, and meditate on it. And Lord, for everything you do, we'll give you the praise and the glory. For you alone are worthy. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Begin to head back to John chapter 16. We have for almost seven and a half years now been studying our way through the life of Christ because Paul said, I want to know him. If you're going to know him, you're going to have to study his life because the world says a lot about him, but most of what they say bears no resemblance to reality whatsoever. So we've been studying our way through his life. We're in John chapter 16. He's just a few hours from Calvary. This is part 152 of our series. It'll pick up where we left off with Jesus and his faithful 11 having left the upper room and walking their way toward Gethsemane talking together. In John chapter 15, verse 9 through 17, Jesus mentioned love over and over again. In fact, he mentioned it nine times in just nine verses. Then from there to verse 27, he completely flipped that around and spoke over and over again about hate, specifically about how the world was going to hate the followers of Christ because it hates the Christ they're following. Then in chapter 16, verse 1 through 15, He talked to them about the trials they were going to be facing in the future and the Holy Spirit that would be sent to help them through every one of those trials. Now he's going to shift his focus to the immediate trial at hand, something that he'd been gently warning them about for a while now, but that they never seemed to be able to grasp. We'll call this section of verses foreshadowings of trials and triumphs. John chapter 16, verse 16 through 22. Let's read that together, then we'll go back and break it down verse by verse. John chapter 16, verse 16. A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us, A little while, and ye shall not see me? And again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. They said therefore, What is this that he saith, A little while, we cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said, A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me? Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world." And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. Notice, first of all, a prophecy of hours to come. Verse 16 again says, A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Over the course of his lifetime, Jesus had traveled fairly extensively, at least as far as people in that day would have been concerned. In our day, we wouldn't think so because we could drive to every location he ever went to in his entire lifetime in under a day's time. But back in his day, for a person to have been born in Bethlehem and then emigrated briefly into Egypt and then come back into the land of Israel and then moved north up, up north to Nazareth and then in his adulthood gone to places like Jerusalem and Samaria and the wilderness of Judea and Capernaum and across the Sea of Galilee, the land of Gennesaret, that made a person fairly well-traveled. But as Jesus was walking and talking with his men here in these verses that we're considering, his steps were getting very few. Now please understand that as he walked toward the Garden of Gethsemane, he was not several hours worth of a walk away from Calvary. He was at best just several minutes geographically worth of a walk away from Calvary. All of it, Gethsemane, Calvary, the tomb, was in the same general vicinity. But not only were his steps getting few, his time was getting short as well. He'd lived in the flesh on this earth approximately 33 and a half years. 
years. He'd gone from infancy to toddlerhood to childhood to young adulthood to being a full-grown man. He'd done three and a half years worth of public ministry. But now his life was going to be measured in hours, not days, not weeks, not months, not years. So knowing this and wanting his disciples to know it, he said, A little while and ye shall not see me. And again a little while and ye shall see me because I go to the Father. For three and a half years, there had been almost no time at all that they had not seen him. And now here he was telling them that in just a little while, they were not going to see him. He was telling them what he had so often already told them, that he was going to be put to death and placed in a tomb. He was going to be taken from them, crucified, and his lifeless body would be entombed and sealed behind a huge stone. And that is where, if he were a normal man, We could rightly expect the story to end, but he has never been and will never be a normal man. He's the Son of God and God the Son, and thus it is that right after telling them, a little while and ye shall not see me, he immediately said, and again a little while and ye shall see me because I go to the Father. Now, it's not even remotely hard to figure out what he was saying. In a little while, just a few hours, he was going to be put to death and have his lifeless body entombed behind a gigantic stone sealing that tomb. But in a little while, just a few days, they would see him again because his resurrected body was going to come out of that tomb so that he could go to his father. They would see him die, and then they would see him three days later when he was no longer dead. The Jews were surprised by the resurrection. The soldiers were surprised by the resurrection. The priests were surprised by the resurrection. The scribes were surprised by the resurrection. The Pharisees were surprised by the resurrection. The Sadducees were surprised by the resurrection. The disciples were surprised by the resurrection. But the one person who was not surprised by the resurrection, not even a little bit, was Jesus himself himself. He knew he was going to die. He knew he was going to be buried. And he knew he was going to rise again three days later. And if the disciples had had enough presence of mind to pay attention to what he was saying, they wouldn't have been surprised either because he was literally telling them all of that in this verse. And he wasn't stating it like we state things. He wasn't stating it as a a hope or a possibility or even a probability. He did not use the word if. He did not use the word might. He did not use the word maybe. He did not say, now fellas, I'm going to try to pull off the most amazing thing the world has ever seen. I don't really know if I can do it, but I'm going to try my best to rise from the dead three days after I'm killed, and if anybody can do it, I can. So wish me luck, men, because I think I can do it. No, he didn't do that. He just, as a matter of fact and certainty, said, a little while and ye shall not see me, and again a little while and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. That was a prophecy of hours to come. But then notice number two, a perplexity among the disciples. After he said that, look at what happens in verses 17 and 18. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while and ye shall not see me, and again a little while and ye shall see me, and because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, what is this that he saith? A little while. We cannot tell what he saith. It's sort of funny to look at all the times, the life and ministry of Christ, that as men got their little heads together and said, what in the world is he talking about? Did did you guys understand any of that? What did he mean? Jesus had just told his 11 faithful men that in a little while, just a few hours, they wouldn't see him. He was going to be put put to death and put in a borrowed tomb. Jesus had just told his 11 faithful men that in a little while, just a few days, they would see him. He was going to rise again so he could go to his father. Now, for for their part, though, his men were not encouraged. For their part, his men were also not enlightened. For their part, they were simply perplexed. They didn't get it. They got their heads together. They whispered and questioned about with each other. What in the world is he talking about? But before you in your mind patronizingly nod and smile at those men, oh, oh, how dull of understanding they must have been. Had we been there, we would have got. Can I remind you of something? You're holding something in your hand they didn't have access to. 
You're holding the book that tells all about it. You can do this and flip two or three pages to the right, and you can read about what he was talking about because it's already happened, and you've heard it preached probably 10,000 times in your life. They didn't have that benefit. We're sitting here 2,000 years later examining it after the fact for about the thousandth time with a printed record of it in our hands. They didn't have the luxury. Now, yes, there were some Old Testament passages that alluded to it. Yes, Jesus had told them about it, even though it was usually in a bit of a veiled form. But all this was brand spanking new to these men. And all of those men, let me remind you, were mental and emotional wrecks at that moment anyway because they just left the upper room where they'd been informed that one of them was going to betray Jesus. Now, if there's ever a time when you don't think clearly, when you're an emotional wreck, you don't think clearly. You may be the most logical, rational, intelligent, clear-thinking person on earth, but when your world falls apart... You don't think rationally. So that's a good explanation as to why these men are perplexed when Jesus has point blank told them about this. These men are not in a very clear thinking condition this time. So even though Jesus spelled it out for them pretty clearly, they didn't get it. They were perplexed. We see a prophecy of hours to come, a perplexity among the disciples. Then notice number three, a picture of Calvary and the resurrection. Let's look at verses 19 through 21. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said a little while and ye shall not see me, and again a little while and ye shall see me? Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she's in travail, hath sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she's delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. Do you remember that we're studying the life of Christ? What we're studying is not just some random passage for random reason. We're, we're trying to know Jesus better. And I mention that at this point because what I see in verse 19 is of immeasurable comfort to me. Jesus knew what they wanted to ask even before they asked it. You starting to see where I'm heading with that? Do you need to pray? Absolutely. By all means, pray. Should you pray? Absolutely. By all means, pray. But when you pray, please remember that you are not having to bring Jesus up to speed about what's going on in your life and what circumstances are tearing you inside and out. He already knows everything that's going on. He already knows what your heart's crying out for. He already knows what you're going to ask and how you're going to ask it even before you ever ask it. Jesus knew that his men wanted to ask about this, but they seemed hesitant to do so. So since they wouldn't broach the subject... He broached it for them. He said, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said, A little while and ye shall not see me, and again a little while and ye shall see me? And then he began to describe for them the range of emotions they were about to undergo. But not just them. He also began to describe for them the range of emotions that the world around them was going to be undergoing at the exact same time. Look at what he said. Verily, verily, those words mean truly, truly. Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. In just a few hours, those devoted followers and friends of the Lord Jesus Christ were going to weep and lament. Those strong, hardened, tough men were going to put their faces in pillows or on the ground and weep and sob like babies till they felt like they had nothing left inside of them. But at the same time, they were weeping and sobbing the wicked world around them was going to be rejoicing. Caiaphas, the official high priest at the time, the puppet of his father-in-law, Annas, was going to be rejoicing. He'd finally gotten rid of that Jesus problem. Annas, the former high priest who still held the power of the high priest behind the scenes, was going to be rejoicing. His money-making machine there in the temple, selling animals and exchanging money, could finally go back to full swing now that Jesus wasn't there to flip over tables and chase people away with homemade whips. The Pharisees and Sadducees seed who'd lost so many followers to Jesus because he offered life and they offered only law were going to be rejoicing. They expected their followers to come slinking back in droves now that Jesus was not there with his heaven sent message of, of compassion. The multitudes were going to be rejoicing. They did love a good crucifixion as long as they weren't the victim and they loved having their little religious order that Rome allowed them and that Jesus kept on disrupting with things like scripture and the power of God. The soldiers were going to be rejoicing. They'd make a nice payday off of all of this and get to indulge the bloodlust of their violent flesh. But the thing about a tide is it turns. 
says. Here's what Jesus said next. And ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Part one would be that the disciples were sorrowful and the world was joyful. Part two was going to be that the disciples were joyful and therefore by extension we know that the world was going to be sorrowful. While the disciples would be rejoicing at the resurrection of Christ, Caiaphas and sorrow would be realizing he didn't get rid of his Jesus problem. In fact, it had just gotten a whole lot bigger than it had ever been. While the disciples would be rejoicing at the resurrection of Christ, Annas and sorrow would be realizing that Jesus may not be there to flip over his tables anymore, but that wouldn't matter because people were going to be forsaking the temple to follow the resurrected Christ. While the disciples would be rejoicing at the resurrection of Christ, the Pharisees and Sadducees in sorrow would be realizing that instead of just having Jesus drawing their followers away, they would now have 11 heaven-empowered men who'd seen his resurrection going everywhere telling about him and drawing their followers away. While the disciples would be rejoicing at the resurrection of Christ, the multitudes would be in sorrow realizing that it was their voices who cried out for the death of the one who, as it turned out, was the Son of God after all. While the disciples would be rejoicing in the resurrection of Christ, the soldiers would be in sorrow, realizing that it was their hands that physically put them to death and that God himself would never forget it. All of that Jesus laid out for his men in just a few words. But then in verse 22, he put it in a picture for them that they'd likely never forget. I'll look at verse 21, rather. Look at verse 21. He said, a woman, when she is in travail, that means in labor, hath sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she's delivered to the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. Now, let me help you understand something. Jesus was using the same methodology as Hebrew poetry in what he did in these few verses. Hebrew poetry uses parallelism. It compares and contrasts one thing or set of things to the next to teach or illustrate a point. Just one verse earlier, he'd spoken of the fact that as men, we're going to be sorrowful. Now in this verse, he talks about the woman being in sorrow. So they, in verse 20, are the woman of verse 21. They're the ones that are about to be in deep, agonizing sorrow. But that woman in verse 21 was about to be in deep, agonizing sorrow because she was going into labor. Can I explain something to you in case you do not know? And Brandy, you may want to be aware of this. Ms. Brick, you may want to be aware of this. There is no pain at all on earth like that of when a woman is in labor and squeezing her husband's fingers. There's no pain like that. I'm just telling you, most agonizing, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit silly, but the truth of the matter is, there's no pain like being in labor. They're just not. Again, I, I've never, obviously never been there because in case you don't know, men don't get pregnant. The world seems to be a little bit confused on that. Men don't get pregnant. Preacher, you're being divisive. No, I'm not. I'm being truthful and scientific. Men don't get pregnant. But the lady gets pregnant and she goes into labor and there are anywhere from a few minutes to several hours worth of most intense, agonizing pain anyone on earth will ever know. A woman will feel like she's being ripped to shreds during this process. She'll feel like there's no way she can possibly survive. But in the last half of this picture, Jesus said, but... As soon as she's delivered to the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. I got to be there to watch my wife deliver all three of our children. Now, I grant you, every one of her labors was under two minutes. N not making it up. We didn't even make it to the right hospital with Karis because she's always been the, you know, the difficult one and things like that. But her, her labors were like two minutes. I always told her that if she ever, ever, she ever got pregnant again, we were like going through the drive through window for the next one. That's what we're going to do. But, but even those few minutes, I mean, there would be the, this, this, this intense, agonizing pain, but as soon as it's over, and as soon as the doctor hands the mama that child, that's forgotten. It's forgotten. There's something about holding that baby that makes everything you've been through worthwhile. We've had ladies in this church that have had hours, that, that have had labor that lasted for over 24 hours. We obviously come in a few hours after that. We'd, we'd ask them about it. What was your labor like? How, how bad was it? And you'd expect them to say, oh, the most horrible of it. And, and they just, uh, 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 it's, it's, it's no problem. Look at my baby. Once you've given birth to that child, all the pain just isn't even remembered anymore. Jesus painted the absolute perfect picture to describe what was about to happen. 
Those disciples, like a mother in labor, were about to be brought to the very point of the worst pain and agony in their lives. They were going to feel like they were being ripped to shreds and would never survive. They'd see their precious Jesus taken and tried and beaten and scourged and crucified and laid in the tomb. All their hopes and dreams and plans would be dashed into a tiny million pieces and lay shattered on the ground like shards of glass. But just like labor doesn't last forever, his death would not last forever. And just like a baby comes out of the womb alive and well. Jesus would come out of the tomb alive and well. So the prophecy of hours to come, a perplexity among the disciples, a picture of Calvary and the resurrection, and then notice number four, a promise of how the story ends. Verse 22, he said, and ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you standing and walking there on that vine line path going to Gethsemane. The disciples did indeed have sorrow in their hearts. They knew that someone among them was going to betray their precious Lord. He was telling them that that betrayal would end in his death, but now he once again reiterates that he would literally, physically, eyeball to eyeball, see them again. They were sorrowful right then and there at that moment, but the resurrection was going to make their heart rejoice. But the very last phrase is not simply a restatement of truth. It's a statement about the eternal endurance of that truth. Again, Jesus said of this, and your joy no man taketh from you. They'd certainly try. They'd just never be able to do it. Jesus stated this future certainty as a present truth truth. He did so because it would always be a present tense reality. When they woke up the day after his ascension into heaven, no man would take their joy from them because they'd seen him and they knew that he was alive. When the priests began to harass and arrest them for preaching the gospel, no man would take their joy from them because they'd seen him and they knew he was alive. When James was taken and killed, no man would take their joy from them because they'd seen him and they knew he was alive. When Saul began to make havoc of the church, no man would take their joy from them because they'd seen him and knew that he was alive. When Stephen was martyred, no man would take their joy from them because they'd seen him, they knew he was alive. When Peter was crucified upside down, no man would take their joy from them because they'd seen him and they knew he was alive. When Paul was beaten and shipwrecked and stoned and imprisoned, no man would take their joy from them because they'd seen him, they knew he was alive. When aged John, the last of the living apostles, was boiled in oil, exiled to Patmos, no man would take their joy from them because they'd seen him They knew he was alive. They would take their happiness from them maybe for a while, but happiness and joy are two different things. They would never get to that deep down in the heart joy, that certainty that they knew everything was going to be all right. They would never have their joy taken away. And throughout the 2,000 years that have followed while we've been waiting for his return, We may have hard days, we may suffer trials, we may undergo persecutions, we may be discouraged, we may even be fearful from time to time, but through every bit of that, there's still deep down in our soul a joy that can never be taken from us because we know that death could not hold him. We know that we serve a risen Savior. We know that he's even now at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. We know that he's coming again to receive us unto himself, that where he is, there we may be also. Yes, there are going to be trials, but the triumph we have through him is far greater greater than any trial we'll ever know.